Well, welcome, everybody. It's so great to have you all here. My name is Jack Gillis. I'm an executive director with J.P. Morgan, and we're very proud to be here as a, in our fourth year of sponsoring this event. It seems to get uh, bigger and better every year, which is wonderful. Before I go any further, I wanted to thank Dr. Danforth for being here with us and for all you've done to create this incredible center. <laughs> the applause would have gone on longer if we had more time this morning, I know. But everybody's really thrilled to have you here. Thank you. Well, we're uh, very pleased. I'm going to move this along quickly because we have a lot to cover. And so I'm really here to introduce Dr. Jim Carrington, the president of the Danforth Plant Science Center, and, uh, and just to tell you how happy we are to see such a nice crowd. And we're going to have a, a nice presentation followed by a, a panel discussion. And we're thrilled you're all here. So let's get started. Well, welcome and good morning. Uh, this is the sixth edition of Seeds of Change. And we're thrilled that you've joined us here early this morning. First, I want to give my very sincere thanks to the Danforth Leadership Council, which sponsors this event and which organizes it uh, and uh, uh, develops the program. I especially want to recognize Sandy Rogers, the chair of the Danforth Leadership Council, or DLC, uh, Wes Jones and Chris Danforth, uh, who coordinate our community engagement group, and of course, Jack Gillis, our moderator this morning. Um, Thank you for kicking it off and for your service later in the program with the panel. I also want to acknowledge the tremendous support of Jack and your team at J.P. Morgan. Thank you so much. Since 1987, our Seeds of Change speaker has led Conservation International, one of the most influential and effective environmental and conservation groups worldwide. For nearly 30 years, Conservation International has been building upon a strong foundation of science, partnership, and field demonstration to responsibly and sustainably care for nature, global biodiversity, and for the well-being of humanity. The organization is about 1,000 employees strong, but it works with over 2,000 partners in more than 30 countries. CI has helped establish over 1,200 protected areas across 78 countries on 730 million hectares of land, marine, and coastal areas. That's nearly three times the area of Germany. But our speaker is an innovator, and that's why he's here with us today. When the overwhelming majority of conservation and environmental organizations saw nature first and people second, and saw business and corporations as the enemy, Peter recognized that conservation requires partnerships between government, communities that are affected, and business. And he changed the approach to conservation by placing human needs and human benefits at the center of the conversation. So without further delay, please join me in welcoming to the stage our 2015 Seeds of Change speaker, Peter Seligman. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thank you so much for, uh, for this opportunity, Jim and uh, uh, Dr. Danforth. Thank you for the center and for the community for, for becoming so involved. Um, um, I'd like to just start out by dealing with some of the kind of the obvious. Um, it's obvious standing here in the gateway to the West uh, that we looked at the Western United States as a place to conquer, and uh, and we have been very successful at doing that. And uh, if we look at the the transformation that has taken place in the way that humanity has uh, taken care of this planet Earth. Uh, we see a massive impact that began to accelerate uh, in the the late 19th century. Um, Actually, between 1820 and the present day, per capita energy consumption has quadrupled at the same time that the population has approached 7 billion and is on its way to 9 billion. So um, you, can, you, you can understand why we have had this unintended impact of devastating 
the health of much of the planet's ecological resources. Um, we're not bad people. We just have never been able to get to the place where we understand that uh, uh, the, the ecological foundation of our Earth is actually fragile. And as we add 80 million people each year, and uh, we approach that 9 billion uh, person mark in, uh, in about 2050, uh, we're actually eroding the stock that we depend upon. So, so if I look around the planet and I travel all over the world, I live in Seattle, I'm home a week a month, I'm heading to Africa on Saturday, but this year it's been Indonesia, China, Brazil, et cetera, the South Pacific. Um, we are dealing with a global pandemic right now. And the global pandemic is that we have uh, fisheries that are collapsing. Uh, we have conflict over water resources. We have an extinction rate that's a thousand times normal. Uh, we have climate that's completely weird and, uh, and getting weirder every day. Um, and so we're clearly dealing with a situation that, that is extraordinarily challenging for any nation. And that's what I see, actually. I see every nation on this earth trying to figure out, you know, how do we deal with limiting, limited resources? Um, and, and so uh, the challenge really becomes if you get to that place where you understand that, that, that we are not in a sustainable position, the challenge becomes how do we actually transform the way we think about development? And for most of my history, I wasn't thinking about development. Most of my life was thinking about where are those biodiversity hotspots that if you can find them and protect them, they're secure. And somewhere along the line, um, I realized that at, at Conservation International, we had succeeded in protecting hundreds of millions of acres. And we were very proud of that band of 30 miles of protected areas that you could wrap around the equator. Until you look at a globe and you see that 30 mile strip is a perforated line. It's that, that small. And that's when you realize that the challenge is not protecting places. The challenge is actually redefining the way development takes place. And the challenge is how do you insert conservation of nature right into the heart of development so that we redefine what progress is. And progress cannot be the decimation of nature. Progress has to be how do we actually build a society that understands that we, human beings, are vulnerable if we actually destroy nature. And that is pretty simple. Um, what we did at CI was we changed our mission nine years ago from protecting biodiversity to a mission of supporting human well-being by protecting ecosystems that give us goods and services that we all depend upon. And that's forests that are our water factories. It's coral reefs that are protein factories. Um, it's, uh, it's mangroves that protect our cities from storm. Um, it's th those are the fundamentals. It's biodiversity that are our medicines. It's understanding that uh, this planet is the way it is, and the way it is is what allows us to be here. And, and so when you begin to think about, about that issue of, of how do we redefine how we develop, you recognize that, that this can't be an environmental challenge. This is a global challenge. This is a challenge that every sector of society has to be engaged in. Every business has to be involved in it, every school has to be involved in it, every government has to be involved in it, and every single community has to be involved in it. Yet, when you look at the ability of the environmental community to communicate, it's pathetic. We use language and phrases that bounce off of people's ears. And so, so a couple of years ago, I began to think, how do you actually raise the general public's understanding of the issue. You know, they're overwhelmed with solutions and competition amongst organizations, but how do you actually get away from that and kind of raise a general awareness? So I went to a gentleman by the name of Lee Clow. And Lee Clow is well known in tech surface circles because he created the Think Different campaign, the 1984 campaign. He built the brand of Apple. He is the person that Steve Jobs leaned on to create an affair between the public and Apple to create a brand that was loved. And so, so I asked him, um, how did you do that? And he said, well, I didn't sell solutions. I wasn't selling products. I was just trying to kind of cut through the dense advertising and kind of get to a place where people would think differently. And so he said to me, what would you like to do in terms of the public's understanding? And I said, there's this one thing I want to happen. I want humanity to understand 
that nature must thrive, that nature actually is going to survive us. But if nature does not survive, we will not survive. And that's all I want, just to be able to begin that conversation. And so he came up with an idea. And he came to me and he said, I've got an idea. Let's call it the conversation. Let's actually have a conversation between nature and humanity. And what would nature say to people if nature had a voice? And I thought it was clever. And it was thoughtful. And he worked very hard on it. And he produced a series of messages um, with well-known voices. Um, our vice chairman is Harrison Ford. So the first one we did was Ocean. Um, which, if we have time at the end, I'll show you, because it's, it's, a, it's a powerful message. Um, um, but it's not really a conversation. It's more like my father, who was very strict German, telling me what to do. And so I said to Lee Cloud, this is not a conversation. He said, well, let's just call it Nature is Speaking, then. And so we changed the name. <laughs> we changed the name to Nature is Speaking. And so um, what's happened is this. We did them with eight well-known voices in English. We then did eight well-known voices in Brazil and Portuguese. And then we did eight well-known voices in Mandarin, in China. There have been three billion impressions, tens of millions of downloads. And the concept that we, work, we focus on, and I was asked, what, who do you, you're always asked by marketing folks, who's your audience? And I said, my audience is everybody with a brain and a heart. It's everybody in this room, it's every head of state, it's every child, it's every business person, because we need to have a conversation. And so uh, what I'd like to do before I get into the main topic is I'd like to give you a taste of two of these videos. The first one is Mother Nature and it's Julia Roberts. And the second one is a phenomenal young African actress by the name of Lupita Ngongo, who won uh, the Oscar for 12 Years a Slave. Uh, Julia Roberts is Mother Nature, Lupita is Flower. And they worked hard on the scripts, but the real genius is this gentleman, Lee Clow, who is a 70-year-old surfer from Southern California. So please, could you roll those? Some call me nature. Others call me Mother Nature. I've been here for over four and a half billion years, 22,500 times longer than you. I don't really need people, but people need me. Yes, your future depends on me. When I thrive, you thrive. When I falter, you falter. Or worse. But I've been here for eons. I have fed species greater than you, and I have starved species greater than you. My oceans. My soil my flowing streams, my forests. They all can take you or leave you. How you choose to live each day, whether you regard or disregard me, doesn't really matter to me. One way or the other, your actions will determine your fate, not mine. I am nature, I will go on. I am prepared to evolve. Are you? I am a flower. Yes, I'm beautiful. I've heard it before, and it never grows old. I'm worshipped for my looks, my scent, my looks. But here's the thing, life starts with me. You see, I feed people. Every fruit comes from me. Every potato, me. Every kernel of corn, me. Every grain of rice. 
me, me, I know, but it's true. And sometimes I feed their souls. I am their words when they have none. I say I love you without a sound. I'm sorry without a voice. I inspire the greatest of them. Painters, poets, pattern makers, I've been amused at them all. But in my experience, people underestimate the power of a pretty little flower. Because their life does start with me. And it could end without me. Thank you. So um, we put these together because we really wanted to kind of stimulate a conversation and we decided not to focus on solutions because we didn't want to confuse people about what the answers are. We just wanted to actually think about the concept. Um, but, but when you get to what we started talking about in the beginning, how do you transform the way society relates to nature? It has to be more than a communications team. And so um, what I'd like to talk to you about is how do you actually transform the way development takes place. And, and as, a, uh, as a kind of a, a fundamental approach of our organization since we started it, we have really believed that sound science is absolutely essential for making right policy decisions, that exaggeration of environmental challenges is a great way to start, but it quickly corrodes and erodes credibility. So let's deal with the truth and use good science, number one. And number two, we need smart, sound economics. Conservation has to generate wealth. It has to generate and improve life. It has to affect health. So using those as the basic premise, uh, we have invested enormously uh, in building our science capacity. See, and we have a group at CI called the Moore Center for Ecosystem Science that was originally developed by Gordon Moore, the founder of the microchip and Intel. Um, and then we, uh, we have another group called the Center for Environmental Leadership and Business that just focuses on how do you actually convert production from non-sustainable to sustainable. And it happens that the chairman of a company called Walmart leads that effort for us. Uh, we have a third group. It's called the Center for Environment and Peace, and it just focuses on how do you transform the way governments operate. So let me just talk to you a little bit about, about some examples of how you do this. Because the key thing in our world is that it's not enough to have small, successful projects. We've got a crisis. We need to figure out how do we get the scale. And you get the scale by having the right innovations, the right demonstrations, and most importantly, the right partners. So as an example, if you look at sub-Saharan Africa and you think about the enormous fert fertile, uh, fertile uh, agricultural lands, you look at the great herds, you look at the growing population, you look at the poverty. There is one organization that is really deeply involved in, in sub-Saharan Africa that is respected probably above all others, and that's the, the Gates Foundation. It's the largest foundation in the world. They make enormous investments in helping small holder farmers. Farmers, mainly women, that own a an acre or less. And that's about 200 million families. Yet, their approach to helping those farmers has focused on three things. Improving seeds, improving farming technologies, and figuring out how a farmer can get a product to market. All admirable, all needed. But the problem is that every smallholder farmer has a small farm. They don't control the source of their pollinators, their soil fertility, or their water. And so we went to the Gates Foundation and we said, to be able to produce agricultural products effectively, you need to have healthy ecological services. And they said, well, we thought you were just interested in biodiversity, and, and farms don't have biodiversity. And, and we responded, farms need to produce food. But to produce food, they need ecological diversity and ecological services. So the foundation came back and said, OK, what would you like to do? And so we designed and created and have launched with the foundation a program called Vital Science. Vital science is a scientific metric for measuring the contributions that ecological systems make to food production, to agricultural productivity. And the key thing about this is that it's useful, 
for a farmer, but it's also useful for a planning agency. So the government of Ghana or Tanzania can make a determination is, should we actually convert this forest, which is rich in soil, to maize, or should we keep it as a source of fresh water? Basically providing thoughtful, smart, data-rich information so that we can farm in the right places and protect those places that are essential for the productivity of food. Another good example, another partnership. If you're going to transform business, you have to, you have to be able to get away from a one-off engagement with a one enterprise and then a next enterprise and the next enterprise. And so thinking about scale, we decided that the most impactful company that we could influence, if we could influence them, was a company called Walmart. And the reason we were interested in Walmart was not because we were looking for low prices, but because <laughs> Walmart has 150,000 suppliers. They have 2 million employees. They have $700 billion in annual revenues. And our thought was, if they could be transformed and make sustainability one of their key criteria for selecting their suppliers, they can transform the supply chain. We were very fortunate because a gentleman by the name of Rob Walton called me one day and he said, I've heard what you're doing. I'm interested in visiting with you to talk about my family philanthropy. And we became acquainted and we began to travel around the world and mainly going on diving because he loved marine issues and we went to rainforest as well. And, and one trip off of the coast of Costa Rica as we were becalmed on a vessel, we had just stopped diving and were surrounded by about a thousand spinner dolphins. I said to him, Rob, no matter how much money you give us, if you want to change the world, you got to change Walmart. And he said, well, I can't do that. I'm just the chairman of the board and it runs independently. <laughs> His son was with us, his son Ben. And his, ben, his son Ben said to his father, Rob, his dad, that's not true. I mean, you're the largest shareholder. You can affect that. And so what came out of that conversation was an introduction to their CEO, a man named Lee Scott. And this is where the heart and the mind come together. I went with a pound of salmon to see Lee Scott, and I said to Lee, here's a pound of salmon. It's the cheapest salmon in the world and they are the largest seller of salmon in the world. The pink is a dye, and the coast of Chile, where this comes from, is an ecological wasteland. And Lee Scott said, I had my first granddaughter last week. I don't want to do that. What do we do? And that's the heart and mind coming together. He brought together his senior management team, and he talked to them about environmental responsibility. Now, they were under siege about lots of things. They were not a loved corporation. And, and his team, one of the young women there raised her hand and said, are you telling us we can come out of the closet about being an environmentalist? And he said, yes. And he said, but we're just going to focus on four product areas. And that's what they tried to do. But the concept of actually doing something good spread like a virus in the company. And everybody in every product line said, we want to do this too. And the rest is history. They decided they were going to look at their entire line. They're going to look at where they get their food, the produce, how the computers are made, how waste is handled, how light bulbs are handled, how refrigeration is handled, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what they learned and what we learned was that they were actually able to convert this concept of sustainability into money. Leave it up to Walmart. They figured it out. And this is, these are some of the numbers. They said to their supply chain, we will not accept goods that are wrapped in, in uh, packaging that is not recyclable. They save $300 million a year not having to take that to a garbage dump. They focus on getting to 100%, a doubling of fuel efficiency. They got up to 80% fuel efficiency increase. They saved $130 million a year in transportation costs. And the most important thing was they pushed it down the supply chain. So many people, probably some in this room, who are suppliers to Walmart know about this. An anecdote. When I was diving with Rob Walton, I have a very good friend. I live in Seattle who plays for a band called Pearl Jam. 
and his name is Stone Gossert. And Stone was diving with us, and he said to me, Peter, I know that you like to kind of push things along, but you're, you shouldn't be talking to Walmart. They're bad. I said, well, you, this Rob, he's a nice guy. He said, no, no, bad. <laughs> About four months after our diving trip and four months after we began this engagement with, with Walmart, Stone called me one night, very late. I said, I got to tell you this. I just got off the phone with our supplier of CDs, and I called them to say, I want to get away from plastic. We want to go to cornstarch. And our supplier said, oh, oh, we're already doing that. And Stone said, why? I said, well, because Walmart won't take it if we don't, if we don't do that. <laughs> so, so that's how you get the scale. If you look at, at then this challenge, if you're trying to transform production from being non-sustainable to sustainable, you have to work with all the players. Yesterday I spent most of the day at Monsanto, and we have worked with Monsanto since 2008. And uh, it has been a remarkable experience. Of course, um, living in Seattle, I hear a lot about Monsanto. Um, I don't think I've ever heard something nice about Monsanto in Seattle. <laughs> But the people at Monsanto are remarkable. It's a wealth of intellectual talent, and they're mission-driven. And they're dealing with a really key issue. How do we feed people? If you go to Tanzania and you visit with smallholder farmers in Tanzania, and you realize that they are dealing with drought that is unpredictable, they no longer can grow their corn. They no longer can grow maize. And so everybody says, switch from maize to sorghum or millet. And they say, well, we don't eat sorghum and millet. And so instead what they're doing, instead what they're doing is they're clearing their forests, converting it to charcoal, selling the charcoal in town so they can buy corn. That's awful. That's exactly what they should not be doing. What if there were a drought-resistant corn? In other words, we are dealing with challenges that require innovation. We cannot say, we will not address or accept innovation. Our partnership with Monsanto is not a big deal in the United States. It's a very big deal in Brazil. In Brazil, what we are doing together is we're looking at landscapes. What we've been able to do is create a partnership with Monsanto in the Sahado, which is where most of the beef comes from, and the Atlantic Forest, which has been completely destroyed. And the partnership is how do you restore native vegetation, how do you secure the last remaining vestiges of ecological health? How do you increase productivity, increase livelihood, protect nature? And it's working. It's a landscape approach. And my conversations were with, with Monsanto are basically saying, you cannot solve global issues by being siloed. You need to kind of open up your vision. If you're involved in a landscape, whether you're a farmer or a logger or you're a watershed manager, you better understand what's happening in the other disciplines that affect that landscape. We're doing the same thing with USAID and support from the Walton family in, in Indonesia, in North Sumatra, a landscape scale approach. How do you reduce deforestation? How do you go to low carbon agriculture? How do you increase palm oil production through intensification as opposed to deforesting? And how do you improve the livelihood of all the smallholder farmers? In other words, what we're seeing are there are solutions. To be able to have these solutions last, we have to convince the private sector that they have to pivot. And the pivot has to be a pivot to sustainability. And the reason it's in their enlightened self-interest is that they secure, they secure a supply chain they, they really turn on their employees. They turn on their customers. And that's what makes a great company. And what we're seeing across the board is a buy-in to this idea. When we started CI, we did not have that response. When we started CI, the doors were closed or were given a $1,000 check. Then we went to kind of CSR, where, well, we want to do it, but we want to control it. It's through our foundation. Today, what we're seeing with many, many companies is a recognition that sustainability needs to be inside of their DNA. I mentioned Walmart, mentioned Monsanto. 
Starbucks. We started with Starbucks 20 years ago. I live in Seattle. Howard Schultz lives down the street. His children and my children went to school together. He would not give me the time of day until my kids started harassing his kids. He said, OK, I'll talk to you. <laughs> and we began a conversation. And the conversation was about, who is your demographic? Will your demographic be happy if they find out that coffee is grown by deforesting rainforests? And the answer is obviously no. And what we showed is that you can actually grow coffee beneath the shade of a tree. And so Starbucks said, if you can grow coffee that's of the right quality beneath the shade of a tree, we'll buy it from you. And so we started a program, it was called Cafe Standards. It was Farmer Equity and Conservation Coffee. We announced about three weeks ago that 99% of all of Starbucks coffee globally is now grown by Cafe Standards. They do not let, cut down a single tree to grow their coffee. And obviously, their product, their, 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 their supply, their demand has grown enormously. They're in it, and they're committed. Now, for the first 15 years of our partnership, they were really unhappy if I said, we got to go to other coffee companies. But what they have agreed to today is that coffee could become the first 100% sustainably produced commodity. Now, Starbucks only has 3%, so they're not going to do it alone. But what's interesting is the EU, the European Union, imports 65% of all the coffee in the world. So that's the leverage point. And so our team in Brussels has been working with the EU to be, to be able to create a new set of regulations which will actually establish that coffee will not be imported into Europe if it causes deforestation. And that's the power of Starbucks and CI and good science working with policymakers. I want to close by just telling you one other, one other tale. Um, about five years ago, I was in one of the many gatherings for the United Nations on climate. And I was sitting in a coffee shop, very frustrated. I was in Copenhagen, where absolutely nothing happened. And sitting alone was a gentleman. Um, and I went over to talk to him. And his name was Anote Tang. Anote Tang was very, very dismayed because he was the president, and still is the president, of a small island nation that's located 4,300 miles due west of Los Angeles. It's a country called Kiribati. Um, it's actually spelled Kiribati, but the British consul in around 1903, when he was typing the name, his typewriter didn't have a T and an I, so he put an S instead. And so it's pronounced Kiribati. Um, um, so, so Anote Tang said, everybody's talking about forests, as they should be. <coughs> because as you may or may not know, deforestation causes about you know, between 10 and 13% of all CO2, CO2 emissions in the world. And he was saying, but no one's thinking about our island nations. We are the frontier of climate change. He said, my island nation of Kiribati has 32 atolls. They're divided between uh, the four um, sectors where the, the international dateline and the equator cross. Uh, the highest point is two meters. Storms now are moving north from the equator and south from the equator, and they're cutting through our islands. And yet we're out here, oceans acidifying, we have no protection. And so we began a program with a Note de Tang to figure out how to secure his coral reefs and his island nations. They have 70,000 people there. They are trying to figure out how to migrate with dignity. They know that they will have to leave within 20 years. But what's interesting about Kiribati is not just the tragedy of climate change and the impact it has on them. The interesting thing about Kiribati is that it covers a geographic area about 2 thirds the size of the United States of America. In other words, it's really considered, it's defined in the United Nations as a small island developing state. It's actually a giant ocean empire. And 60% of the world's tuna move through it. And so we began to work with the Note Tang on the creation of a major marine protected area called the Phoenix Island Protected Area, which was set up. It's the size of the state of California. And through one of our funds called the Global Conservation Fund, we created a trust fund that they matched uh, to be able to manage and care for this area. 
But what was really significant was we began to have a conversation with President Tong about Polynesia. And what he said to me was, look, there are 15 island nations that control 8% of the Earth's surface, 23 times the size of the state of Alaska. And our 15 island nations were all settled by voyagers from eight vacas, or canoes, thousands of years ago, and we have the same blood. We come from the same place. We all believe the ocean is us and we are the ocean. And so why don't we take this concept of the Phoenix Island Protected Area and spread it all over the Pacific? And so about three years ago, I went to the Cook Islands with the Note Tang and met with the heads of state of all these 15 nations. And we spent three days together talking about an idea, and we created something called the Pacific Oceanscape. It's an area, 8% of the Earth's surface, 15 nations, 60% of the global tuna. And what's interesting about this is that most of these nations depend upon tuna fishing licenses for their revenues. The other interesting thing is that amongst them, they do not have a Coast Guard, a Navy, an Air Force, or an Army. In other words, they own a vast amount of territory on this planet Earth, and they have no surveillance, monitoring, and control. That means the US fleet, the South Korean fleet, the Taiwanese fleet, the Spanish fleet, and most dangerously, the Chinese fleet, which has expanded from 400 vessels to 1,200 vessels, just goes through and takes what they want. So we began an analysis in our science team, and we found that Big Eye Tuna is down to 16% of its original stock. And so the question becomes, can you come up with a strategy when you have political will, when you have the right science, when you think about ways to increase the revenue from these fishing vessels for these countries so that you can increase the economics? Can you come up with an effective strategy to actually secure the health of the oceans? And the answer is yes. And the reason it's yes is because they actually have come together with an alliance. The U.S. Coast Guard has agreed to provide uh, Coast Guard vessels to intercept uh, uh, poaching and illegal fishing vessels. The New Zealand fleet has agreed. The Australian fleet has agreed. And now we have the technology through the U.S. intelligence agency to actually use algorithms to tell which vessels are fishing illegally. So instead of having to patrol the entire South Pacific, you can pinpoint which vessel is illegal and you can go for it. And when each vessel that's picked up has a $3 million fine to be released, it really dissuades fishing fleets from actually illegal fishing. And so what this does, it allows us to really blend science, culture, business incentives, and governance so you can actually achieve sustainability. And that's really the message that I will end on, is that I started out by saying that this is a massive challenge. We are at a moment today like never, like we've never had before. And that moment is that we have social media, we have every school, business, community, government in the world thinking about these issues. We have never had that before. And we have technology, so we can actually solve some of these problems. And what social media does is it sees every corner. You cannot be clean in California and St. Louis and dirty in Nigeria and get away with it. You're either a predator or a partner, and the world sees it. And that's a fascinating and powerful motivation for a transformation of the way companies and governments behave. Finally, I have to say that the key thing that really motivates me and motivates others is that this is in our enlightened self-interest. And the role that each of you can play is that you're leaders, you're here, you have audiences, you have platforms. You can control who you vote for, what you buy, who you talk to, and how you message. And that's a powerful position. And you have to take advantage of that. Because we actually do not have time to waste. Because our children and our grandchildren need us to do some smart things. And that means break down the silos, communicate, and actually transform how we think about nature and the fact that humanity depends upon nature being healthy. Thank you. Peter, thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful.
Well, we're going to bring some more people into the conversation now. And um, I'd like to just quickly introduce our <coughs> other panelists. Um, again, I'm Jack Gillis. You know the guy to my right. To his right is Tom Gallagher, the Director of Environment at the Boeing Company. Tom is responsible for leading the development of company-wide strategy and policy, including continuously improving the environment, <coughs> environmental performance for, the Boeing, for Boeing's global operations, products, and services. Of course, you all know Boeing is one of the world's largest aerospace companies and uh, leading manufacturer of commercial planes, jetliners, defense, space, and, uh, and security systems. To Tom's right is Carol Clark, a senior vice president at Flight <coughs> King Hillard here in town, where she works in corporate issues and the corporate issues and communications group, providing communications and sustainability counsel to her clients. She has more than 25 years of experience in areas such as corporate and social responsibility, communications, issues management, and environmental affairs, including 18 years with Anheuser-Busch and ABMBEV. Of course, you all know Fleischmann Hillard is a top global communications firm specializing in public relations and public affairs, among other things. And to Carol's right is uh, Jeffrey Whitford. Jeffrey is the Director of Global Citizenship at Sigma Aldrich. He's responsible for developing and implementing the strategic programs designed to enhance Sigma Aldrich's position as a global leader in greener chemistry, environmental sustainability, and social responsibility. And of course, Sigma Aldrich is a leading life science and high technology company focused on enhancing human health and safety. With that, I'd like to get started with some questions. And Carol, I'm going to turn to you first, if I may. <clears throat> if you could talk a little bit about your experience with your clients, primarily with a focus on how you've seen attitudes <clears throat> around sustainability changing over the last five or 10 years. And please feel free to draw on your time at Anheuser-Busch as well. Sure. So um, as uh, Jack mentioned, I've been in the sustainability field for about 20 years, started when I was 12. Um, <laughs> But uh, we have uh, seen quite a bit of change, particularly in the last five to 10 years, and I think, Peter, you referenced it. Consumers expect that the products they buy now will be put together in a sustainable way. Companies like Walmart have driven their suppliers to take these kinds of things into account. At Anheuser-Busch InBev, we were reporting on an annual basis to Walmart in terms of our energy use, <coughs> our sustainable farming efforts, all those kinds of things. So really, we've seen a ramp up in the past 10 years. I think, too, from a Flushman Hillard perspective, we have a sustainability practice that has grown over the years, and it's grown around the world. We were, um, a colleague and I were just on the phone with with our Hong Kong office yesterday where the Hong Kong government has now put in place some additional reporting requirements for companies. So this is really going global. Everyone is expected to be part of this. And I'll just also add that um, the UN meeting at the end of um, September, the sustainable Deve development goals were, were just launched. And business has a huge role to play in accomplishing those new goals. So we're definitely seeing this moving forward. Carol, just if you could just touch a little bit on what what do you think is driving these changes? Is it and Peter mentioned uh, social media? Uh, obviously, customers are demanding changes. Give us a flavor for what's driving these changes. Sure, I think also we're seeing um, from a company perspective investors getting uh, more interested in these things, and a lot of that comes out of the European community. At AB InBev, we are a European-based company and the investor community there has analysts who do nothing all day except look at social responsibility um, <coughs> measures for companies putting out ratings and we were at AB InBev the company does road shows with those investors just looking specifically uh, at what the company does on sustainability issues. So you're starting to see that coming over to the US now, I think even more. And when your investors get interested, then your board members get interested, obviously. And then uh, your CEO gets very interested and in, in the senior leadership team. So it really comes full circle. And uh, the, other, the other piece of it is it's really driving savings and revenues for companies. At uh, AB InBev, the first round of environmental goals that the company put together over a three-year course uh, saved the company $92 million. So when you have that kind of savings coming to your bottom line, again, that gets attention and people understand the importance of these issues. Thank you. Tom, turning to you, uh, please give us a, a feel for what's going on at Boeing in this area, um, and not just uh, 
from an operational standpoint, lead certified factories and things like that, but also how you're driving sustainability into your, your very products. Sure. Uh, before that, though, I'd like to uh, piggyback on this please, question, please. too. It's a, it's a big issue for us. Um, we're uh, not so much of a global company, about 160,000 employees, and the vast majority of them are in the United States. Um, we have operations, obviously, overseas, but a good 85% of our business, our employees are in the United States. However, um, this, we, are, we track environmental trends over, over the years because we sell internationally. Most of our sales are international. Most of our business is international. Um, what we have seen is an increasing uh, concern about climate change and environmental sustainability issues throughout the world over the last 10 years to the point now where um, the United States, about 45% of the people consider climate change to be a very serious issue. However, everywhere else, it's much more considered much more serious. In Europe, it's 55%. In South America, it's 65%. Mm -hmm. So as a, as a company that sells outside of the United States, we take that very, very seriously. The other thing that we are seeing in our company is that we need talent to keep going. Um, uh, people are, are, are very valuable and difficult to obtain asset. The people that put together our planes our engineering, our workforce. And the new people that are coming in that we have uh, talked with and see demand to work for a company that takes the environment seriously and will not, will choose on that very basis not to work for one company or another. So um, as a company where uh, roughly in five years, within five years, about 39% of our workforce will be able to retire it's sort of a burning platform for us to make certain that we get the right people in and uh, we project the right image to those people that are uh, concerned for the environment. So that's, that must put a lot of pressure on, on moving forward in this area. There must be times, though, in which there's a profit and loss decision to be made and where the, the, the right thing to do from a sustainability <coughs> standpoint might conflict with the short-term profits. How, how, are those, how do those conversations play out? Yeah, um, of course, we, we uh, develop, break our environmental strategy into three areas, really. First of all, the first piece is designing our products for the environment. Um, our aircraft, our space systems, those types of products, are, are, that's what we think about first. What's going into them? What kind of chemicals? Can they be recycled before we even start building the product? The second piece of it um, is uh, innovation innovation for sustainability within our operational facilities. How can we operate in a more sustainable way with uh, how we use uh, water, electricity, that type of thing. We set targets in 2007 of zero growth for uh, water, hazardous <coughs> waste, solid waste. Even though we grew 50%, we actually met those targets over a five year period. And then we've reset those targets uh, in 2012. And the third piece of it is inspiring global collaboration. A little bit like what Peter was saying. Um, how can we, as a company, bring together other entities uh, to further environmental and, and sustainable issues? So let me give you a couple of examples. Biofuels is something that we've been working on globally. Um, biofuels are a replacement for fossil fuels. and and powering our aircraft with biofuels has a significant impact on reducing carbon emissions, that they're about 50% less uh, polluting, in some cases 80%, if you include the whole chain. So we're working on biofuel projects in South Africa, turning uh, tobacco plants into, the, into <coughs> biofuels. We're working on it in, uh, in the United Arab Emirates, where we're growing plants that can be grown in salt water instead of regular water. The one thing we don't want to do with biofuels is to uh, have the fuel replace food sources or use water or other uh, entities that could use food. And so that's a big thing that we've been doing. Um, we've actually uh, flown all of our commercial planes and qualified the engines for biofuel. And here in St. Louis, for instance, the F-18 can fly on biofuel. 
and we've qualified that too. The military is very interested in it too. That's terrific. So we're hoping to, uh, we're hoping that by 2016, one percent of all the fuel used in commercial aviation will be biofuel. And we have no interest actually in selling or getting involved in the biofuel industry. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to get these groups together to Terrific. do that. Terrific. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. Jeffrey, I'm going to turn to you next, if I may. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about the, the way um, that you've driven sustainability into your products specifically, how your customers are responding to that. Yeah. Yeah, I think for Sigma Aldrich, it's one of the most important things for us to take sustainability. We're not that big of a company, so our footprint is actually relatively small. So us reducing our carbon footprint, while important, is not going to make that much of an impact. But Sigma Aldrich offers our customers more than 300,000 products, so kind of the Walmart of science with Saks Fifth Avenue pricing. Um, <laughs> so our opportunity is really as an enabler. And the, the opportunity for us is to go to our customers and say, you are in the midst of one of the most challenging environments if you're in a pharmaceutical space because getting new molecules that work that help solve the diseases or challenges we're facing takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of uh, research. It takes a lot of resources to actually manufacture those. And the pharmaceutical space is one of the most environmentally detrimental spaces for manufacturing. So what can we do to provide you with starting materials that help reduce your impact by 10, 20, 30, 40, 50% as you go through that process? So when you're doing your R&D, and then when you move to scale up, and hopefully through, uh, through uh, the validation of that drug and it goes to market, you can significantly reduce that impact of that material. And that's really the role that we are able to start playing and that I would say our customers are beginning to recognize that it becomes a pass-through benefit that they can then give to their customers. And so really the traditional markets where we started, so be that um, academic research or the pharma space, are really just the tip of the iceberg and really where we become more interesting and more powerful uh, to make this impact is when we start getting to what we consider the applied market space. And that's when we partner with places like Unilever or Nike or PNG, where we're talking to them about the formulations that they're using for Tide or for other things. And being able to switch out materials that are bio-based, that have less hazardous components within them, and that we are able to quantify what that impact is and how they are then actually reducing the follow through of that product and then they can take that and go to their customer with it because as Carol was saying, customers are looking for this. They're making buying decisions based on this. So that's really the role that Sigma Aldrich gets to play as an enabler of making that technology possible while still making the product um, effective. Can you give us an example, please? Yeah, so we have, um, what we manufacture is not big. So the impact and scale, once again, not big, but it's the multiplier that becomes possible. So we make a product called beta amylase. It comes from sweet potatoes. So we used to use about 6,000 sweet potatoes, 6,000 pounds of sweet potatoes. Um, and we manufacture this one time of year. So we got the 6,000 pounds of sweet potatoes in. We used 1,900 gallons of acetone in the preparation of this product. And we said, can we do something different with this? So we had two scientists who went off they were kind of doing some research. Interestingly enough, they were avid at-home craft brewers. So they were doing some research for that and recognized that there was something that they could take from that process. It was actually a reference from a 1953 uh, text that they took. They brought it back into the office, and it was about stripping a phenol off of, um, off of the pro out of the process. So they brought that in. They took it, put it into the R&D process, and what they were able to do was really dramatic they eliminated the need for 4,000 pounds of sweet potatoes. So we were able to get the same amount of product out of 2,000 sweet potatoes. They co completely eliminated the use of acetone. So that's a solvent, it's not the nicest thing. That is completely removed from the process. Then we were able to change the process because of this, this phenol stripping and take the need for any excess energy or heat and pressure out of the reaction completely. So now we've made that energy neutral. So you pile all of these things up and then a bonus was that the product actually was 15% purer than what we had started with. So you have these examples where we're deploying our scientists onto these, these types of um, projects and realizing where we can get scale and where we can, and can grow that impact and going to bigger value products um, and moving along. And that's really another outflow of, of what we do. And then we're also partnering with academic partners. So there's a ton of research that happens in academia that gets stuck in academia. 
So how do we pull that out of academia and then commercialize it so more people can have access to that technology and then begin to affect the environmental footprint of research around the world? Thank you. Fantastic. Peter, we've heard some great examples. Um, one thing that strikes me is many of these examples have shown that there's cost savings to be derived from doing the right thing. There's customers who are demanding this. Um, are we, though, just sort of addressing the low-hanging fruit at this stage? And where do we, how, do we, how do we make the next leap forward? There must be situations where we're going to have to make change, where it's not going to be easy, where it's not going to be the profitable thing to do, um, where, uh, you know, the, the Mother Nature video, it's, it, we, we, need, we need to make ma major changes here. And how can, how can uh, organizations like CI help? in the for-profit sector? Well, first of all, I think that we should recognize that these three examples are remarkably powerful examples. You go from, from you know, in different scales. But what's really fascinating about this is that there are thousands of companies all over the world that are doing this. Mm -hmm. So this is not little. This is big. And this didn't happen 10 years ago. I mean, in other words, this is a big deal. It's, it's you know, you, you, we, we have a tendency to look at the bad news of the moment without seeing the way trends are shifting. And this reflects a very, very significant trend. And it doesn't just affect the individual companies. It goes to every one of their suppliers. Right. And, and so, so I think that we should, you know, hang on the encouragement of this. This Absolutely. is really, really exciting. And it's happening in China. It's happening in Brazil. It's happening in Indonesia. It's happening all over the world. So that's, that's the really, you know, big news. There clearly is, there, I see two major elephants in the room. One elephant is our values. I mean, we need, what the Pope said was just genius. We need an 11th commandment. That have, thou shalt cherish the earth. I mean, we forget about that. We're, we go into a market and we don't know where food comes from. We turn on a faucet, we don't even know where water comes from. Mm -hmm. We have to begin to reawaken our connection to nature and understand that we actually depend upon that. And that's kind of a core value. And if we can get that core value turned on, then we're not just going to be thinking about how we reduce our carbon footprint. We're going to be thinking about how do we take care of all of nature? And, and the thing that was worried me about this intense focus on CO2, which obviously is essential and really important, is that people are involved in CO2 reductions, like the Silicon Valley gang, because of greed juices. It's, we got to find a new way to produce energy, low carbon, we will make a lot of money, without focusing on the potential impact on nature of that transformation. And what you said before was really interesting, Tom, because what you're doing is really important. You're looking at how do you generate biofuels using plants grown in salt water, looking at what's the impact on the food chain so you're not actually increasing the price of the tortilla. Um, and, and, but many institutions are not doing that. Many institutions, I'll just give you a quick example. The EU decided they were going to have 20% of their energy supplied by biofuels. Mm -hmm. The Indonesian government said, great, we are going to cut down our rainforests, we're going to plant palm oil, and we're going to send that north, and we're going to send it to Europe. Mm -hmm. And so the unintended consequence of a smart policy was devastation. And so, so we have to really understand that we have to keep in mind this core value, which is we want to avoid unintended consequences, number, two, number one. Number two, we really need to focus on how do we reduce carbon emissions. That is another massive elephant in the room. I am very encouraged by the progress that's being made leading up to the Paris negotiations. The bilateral partnership between China and the United States is extremely important because it sends a market signal so that companies are beginning to think, how are we going to reduce our own CO2 footprint and we will actually get credit for this? And so there's voluntary carbon works, like Disney donate, they, they reduce, they, they offset half of their CO2 by protecting forests in Peru. And we're seeing a lot of that happen. So the, this, the market mechanism 
and the signal from China and U.S. is important. But many, many businesses and many governments are coming together in, uh, in, in Paris. So I think that that's a big deal. I don't expect a major deal to come through because it's hurting cats. Uh, but you will see bilateral agreements. You'll see businesses standing up. You'll see a raise, an increased awareness. And, and what we need to understand, and this is like my last thought on this, is what everybody near, here needs to understand is that, that everybody talks about mitigation or reducing CO2 emissions, which we have to do. But let's not fool ourselves. We are already in the age of adaptation. We have to adapt to the shifts and the changes that are going to take place, because climate change is all over us. And we have to be responsive. And the bottom line is that the most effective barrier and protection to climate change and to be able to adapt to climate shifts is ecological resilience. It's genetic diversity. It's the ability of species to actually respond to the changes in ocean acidification and temperature. And so the protection of biodiversity is a core strategy for adaptation to climate change. Absolutely. I think that's well said that, you know, we've heard some great examples here of you use partners versus predators. And fortunately, we're, we're here on stage with, with great representatives of partners and companies that are behaving in the right way and doing the right things. But it's going to take, it seems to me, it's going to take some real collaboration between uh, organizations like yours, companies, so that, they're, so that the companies that are doing the right things are rewarded for doing so and the, and the predators are punished. What, what steps do we need to take in those areas? Uh, first of all, if you go online to Nature is Speaking, you can see all these videos. And they're, they're, you can see them in Mandarin if you want, or English or Portuguese. Um, and I recommend Harrison Ford and Kevin Spacey. They're really outstanding. Um, so um, the, the, the recommendation that, that I have is, uh, is if you're going to buy a plane, buy it from Boeing. <laughs> <laughs> 20% more fuel efficient than our competitor. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's, you know it's, it's pretty simple. We have to begin to, to live our values. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, you know, we have the opportunity to do that. We can make choices, and we should make the right choices. Um, it's hard to, to, to change our behavior, but it's essential that we do. So buy the right things. You know, as I said earlier, you know, support the political leaders. It doesn't make any difference which side of the aisle they're on. Support the political leaders that understand this. And, uh, and put pressure on the political process to actually you know, be awake. Um, and, uh, and then uh, find an organization, the local organization, that's do conservation. You know, be involved with a local land trust in Missouri. I mean, around say, do stuff here that actually makes a difference. And, uh, and then think global. And uh, go to CI's website and, I mean, support the Nature Conservancy and the World Wildlife Fund. I mean, get involved. Thank you. Thank you. We'll probably end it there. We're a couple of minutes overdue. Jim, Dr. Carrington, I'm going to have you come back up. Thanks. <clears throat> wow. I have been uh, thinking for the past hour what to say. And uh, up until just a few minutes ago, when you said something, I was blank. I might still stammer up here, uh, but here it is. I get asked a lot, how do you hire people at the Danforth Center? What do you look for? And I explain what we do and the types of people that we're hiring. And we're in this very fortunate position with our expansion, with the terrific resources that we've been provided with from generous donors and granting agencies. We have this opportunity to build teams here. And what are, we, what are we building them for? Well, as a plant science research institution, we're building teams to provide food security. Well, let me explain what food security is, besides the obvious. Food security is our biggest global environmental issue. Food security is our biggest water issue. Seventy percent of all use of water on this planet by mankind is for agriculture. Food security is our biggest water issue. Food security is one of our biggest emissions issue. If you combine the 15 percent or so greenhouse gases produced by agriculture, 
and add it to the uh, high teens percentage contributed by deforestation, why are we deforesting? In large part to provide land for agriculture. We're in the mid 30s. Greenhouse gases that are directly or indirectly due to agriculture as a human activity. Food security is our biggest emissions problem. But these are solvable. The teams that we're building here are focused on providing food security without suffocating the planet. This isn't a 2050 problem. This is a today problem. It's simply going to get worse in the future if we don't act. But there's time, there's talent, there's energy, and there's technology to be developed, and that's why we're here. I want to end with connecting with your statement, Peter, connection with nature. I wrote that down when you said it. <clears throat> you all know that we're constructing a new wing. You all know that we eliminated the landscape out in front of the building. It's a big dirt field right now with tractors and construction workers. Uh, it's a mess out there right now. But the reason we're doing this is to replace what was a manicured lawn and a well-tended garden, a well-tended landscape. We're replacing it with a reconstruction of a tall grass Missouri prairie. It's going to have the contributions of our landscape architects, <clears throat> our scientists like Toby Kellogg, one of the world's leading authorities on the grasses, their biodiversity and their evolution, Missouri Botanical Garden and Shaw Nature Preserve. They're all contributing to build a little tiny piece of our attempt at reinstilling a little bit of biodiversity. But that's not all we're doing. We've got this pond out in front. You've all seen it. I wouldn't characterize it as the greatest symbol of sustainability. It's a pool. There's nothing about that pool that you look at and you say, I want to go into the Danforth Center and learn what I can do to provide food security in a sustainable way and preserve the environment. So we're going to take that pool and we're going to convert it into a living thing. We're going to do a little bit of a dress up on it, uh, but pretty soon you're going to start seeing some plant life in it. So one more thing we're going to do, we're going to put a bridge across it. <clears throat> I'm almost getting choked up thinking about this because you've really motivated me, Peter. That bridge isn't just going to be an architectural feature. It's going to be a symbol that food security that we're working on here in the Danforth Center is intimately connected with biodiversity, our natural landscapes, and our natural diversity. You'll be able to read about it anytime you come to the Danforth Center because we're going to put signage up to explain to the public exactly why it's important to do that and exactly why it's important to support you, Peter, your organization. Peter Seligman, thank you so much for joining us. Honor. Jack, thank you for hosting us. <clears throat> Jeffrey, Carol, Tom, thank you so much for participating in the panel. And especially, thank you all for coming and for sharing this part, for getting up so early and sharing this with us. Have a good day.